I want to let you know that Wednesday this past week was incredible. It was incredible. I, if you were here, then you already know this. On Wednesday, we had over 100 people here for our wonderful Wednesday program and dinner. It was a marvelous program, right? Those of you who were in it, yes. Yes, it was. There's some others. Yeah, it was marvelous. Uh, I want to thank all the volunteers who have made Wonderful Wednesday possible all, all fall and, and especially for uh, Wednesday night. Thank you so much. This week on Wednesday, every Wednesday is fun during Advent. You can come from 1215 to 1245 on Wednesday afternoons and hear our friend John play Christmas and Advent music on the organ. Bring your lunch if you'd like or come and spend time in prayer. In the evenings, Wednesday evenings, we have Food for the Soul, which is a dinner at 530 and worship at 6 o'clock. Chi choir and chimes rehearsals follow that di dinner and service at 6.30 and 7.30. I hope you have seen or already picked up a green sheet of paper, a half sheet. On one side, it has our Advent calendar, just the dates of all the events we have going on during Advent here at Hope. And on the other side, it gives you some opportunities to give in special ways during this Advent season. You can pick these up on a table in the narthex on your way home if you'd like. And one other announcement I want to share is that in your bulletin, we have our poinsettia order form. Today's the last day. Well, actually, tomorrow is the last day we're taking orders so that you can have a poinsettia in, in honor or in memory of someone displayed here for Christmas Eve services. So please get those orders in today or tomorrow if you haven't already. Are there any other announcements you want to share this morning? All right, well, I want to invite you to take a look at your neighbor and say good morning. Wave, say hello. Hopefully you saw how beautiful you are this morning. You are a marvelous looking church this morning and every morning. Friends, let's prepare our hearts and our minds to worship our loving and our living God. Please rise as you are able and join me in this morning's invocation. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, O Promised One, we gather to await your presence. Give us the patience to seek the meaning of these busy days. Give us the courage to wait in times of pain and trouble. Give us the compassion to wait for one another. Give us the faith to wait for the Messiah when we are threatened by the errors of this world. Give us the hope to wait for the Savior even when we cannot hear the angels singing. Give us the love that does not wait when it meets Christ in our neighbor. O come, Emmanuel, our King, and our Savior. O come, Emmanuel, and enter our hearts this day. Amen.
I want to invite our candle lighters to come forward now. Even though we may have trouble seeing it, God is making a way for peace and reconciliation for all the world. God's plan is in motion. We can choose to doubt, to fight, or to trust in faith and embrace the gift of abundant love in Jesus. We light the first two candles in faith as we hope for the fulfillment of all God's promises in the birth of our Savior Jesus. It seems so long ago, so far away, but before we know it, our hearts will swell with everlasting peace. We light these candles as a symbol of the Prince of Peace who is on his way. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. to fight for a place to sit today. This is wonderful. We've got lots of helpers. Today's noisy offering, and I tried to explain this to Geneva and Kennedy's friends, and I'm not sure I did a very good job, so I'm going to try it for the grown-ups. Noisy offering means we collect money in these cute little buckets, and noisy means... It's mostly loose change. Now, if you don't have noisy money, quiet money is all right, too. Let me tell you where this money's going to go, and then we'll do our thing with the buckets. It's going to go to a place called Heifer Project. And Heifer Project is an organization that helps people who need food. Now, I'm going to give you an example. If I wanted someone to have some milk, I could give them a glass of milk, couldn't I? How long would that last? How long would one glass of milk last? How long would it last, Kennedy? Uh, two weeks. One glass of milk would last two weeks at your house? You don't drink very much milk, do you? Okay. For most of us, one glass of milk would be gone in just a few minutes, wouldn't it? What if I gave them a cow? Then they'd have milk to last for a really long time. They could milk that cow and get milk every day. 
That's what Heifer Project does. Instead of giving people just some food, they give them animals that could provide food for a really long time. All right, so here's how noisy offering works. You'll each choose one of my lovely buckets over there. And uh, we noticed that a couple of them are really big, so if you want to choose one of those, you can. Yeah, most of them are this size, though. And then you'll wander among the people, and I think, does the choir have money, too? Okay, so one of you will go up to the choir, and you'll collect people's noisy offering. And when we're done, bring your buckets back up here. Okay, time to choose a bucket. Anybody want this one? No. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Sometimes people wave their hands because they want you to come and see them, so that's a good clue. If everybody goes through the same row, that's not going to work. So try a different row than what someone else is in. <laughs> Watch for the hands in the air. That'll tell you if they want you to come and see them. Taylor, there are some people over here that have their hands up. Wave your arms. Oh, Wyatt got there first. Sorry. Okay, if you think you're done, come up here. We're going to put all the buckets right on the floor in front of the altar. I'm going to put your buckets right here. Wow, some of these are really full. Good thing you took the big one. Stay up here when you set your bucket down. Have we collected everybody? <laughs> All right. Let's, we're, we're ready. We're going to have a prayer together before you go to your seats. Dear God, we thank you for the wonderful work that the Heifer Project does. And we thank you for this generous offering that we have received today. Bless this money for that wonderful use. Amen. Thanks for coming up today. This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah. Chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied exultation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing blunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Great will be his authority, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward, and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of God for the people of God.
Underneath the stars, just a simple man and a wife somewhere in the dark. His words cut the silent night. Take my hand for the child that you carry is God's own. And though it seems the road is long, we're not that far from Bethlehem, where all our hope and joy be. For in our arms we'll cherish him Not that far from Bethlehem beautiful. Can you hear me? Well, that's too bad. <laughs> Danny asked me to uh, speak this morning a couple of weeks ago, and I said, sure, you know, happy to help. And then I remembered, I don't know how to preach. <laughs> but my dad is a retired United Methodist minister. So I emailed him and I said, Dad, I need to steal some of your material. What have you got? <laughs> and he replied, and I am not making this up. This is a quote. It might be interesting for you to exegete Niebuhr's moral man and immoral society. <laughs> that would indeed be interesting. And those of you who come to church only for the crashes would have had a good time. That's not what we're going to do, though. But I think we'd better pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So the sermon series we're working from uh, is from Matt Rawls' book, uh, The Heart That Grew Three Sizes, uh, the familiar Grinch story. And I want to read you a paragraph uh, from this week's reading. There's a kind of subversive parody that lies at the heart of the Grinch's wonderful, awful idea. The Grinch decides to take the marks of Christmas, Santa suit, 
reindeer and sleigh, bag full of toys, sneaking into the house in the middle of the night through the chimney and turn them all on their head. He wears the Santa suit, but he isn't a jolly gift giver. The sleigh is powered by his dog, Max, rather than by flying reindeer. The sack that normally carries children's toys is used to steal them away. The Grinch uses all of the things he hates about Christmas against the Who's, almost as if he is an undercover spy infiltrating the system in order to sabotage it. The Grinch as a character is treating things like Santa's suit and sleigh bells as the very things that make Christmas what it is and using them for a nefarious purpose. Dr. Seuss, on the other hand, is revealing that the decorations and the traditional cold weather symbols we easily associate with Christ's birth aren't what Christmas is all about. We know that. We've done Christmas before, right? We understand that it's not about the trappings and trimmings. It's not about the garlands and the trees and the, the fancier cookies we make at Christmas. Except that stuff is really good, isn't it? You know, I, if you love that stuff, you're my people. I am the holliest and jolliest of elves. I would wear elf shoes with a little curve and a little bell on them all through December if Patrick would let me. He will not, and I know because we have had this conversation. When I was maybe six, my mom was decorating for Christmas on the far side of the house, and I walked up to her and I said, how do you spell Harold? And she said, H-A-R-O-L-D. About half an hour later, she walked into the kitchen and this high off the ground, in festive red crayon, it said, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, H-A-R-O-L-D. <laughs> I was unable to shift the blame for that one to my sister. Mom scrubbed, and then she primed and painted, and then she did it again, and she finally wallpapered that wall and left it for the next people to find out. <laughs> that happened more than half a century ago, and she is still mad. But she has no reason to complain because I got this from her. This is my DNA. When she was three, the first Christmas she was really you know, fully aware of it, they had a, a real tree, of course, as they did then. And those of you who are younger may not realize, but they used to put real candles on the trees, not electric lights. And they'd have like a little crimp thing, a little pincer. You'd put it, obviously, at the end of the branch. And then you'd cut this tree down, bring it inside your house with all of your belongings and your families, slowly let it dry out, and then set it on fire. And my mother fell for that tree, and she fell hard. It was her favorite thing. And she had very loving, very indulgent parents. At the end of the Christmas season, Grandpa tried to take the tree down. And my tiny uh, mother explained that wasn't going to happen. So that tree stayed up all through January and February and March. And a couple days before Easter, Grandpa finally suggested that maybe she'd like to have her photo taken with that tree. She thought that was a fine idea. So he picked it up and said, you know, the light's not good enough in here. Let's take it out by the alley. <laughs> so my innocent, gullible three-year-old mother had we have a picture of her standing by that fully decorated tree with my grandparents standing in shame, hoping the neighbors did not see. And she's beaming in all the innocence and gullibility of youth, and the tree is there. And then Grandma took her hand and took her inside for cookies while my grandfather set a land speed record for undecorating a Christmas tree. It stands to this day. You can look it up. He got those ornaments off and stashed in the garage and the dried hulk of that thing shoved in the trunk and off to the landfill before my tiny mother figured out what had happened. So if you love the trappings, you love the trimmings, I'm with you. Uh, absolutely no judgment here. And yet, the Grinch thought that was all it was about, right? And we know it's not. We know that the Prince of Peace is coming. We know that's why we're making those cookies and hanging those garlands in some kind of slightly convoluted but very festive logic. 
my sister used to date a major league baseball umpire. And he was from St. Louis. Uh, his first game in the major leagues was in St. Louis, just by happenstance. Uh, and they put him at second base, which is where a rookie umpire can do the least damage. And, or so they thought. Uh, and it was a beautiful day, it was middle of the season, it was a beautiful day, and he was standing in the middle of the field where he had gone to games as a little kid. You know, who wouldn't love that, right? And his whole family showed up with the We Love the Ump signs, and he was, stayed focused, he stayed professional, he stayed thinking about what he was supposed to think about for about four innings. And then he, spent, and he said it was literally maybe two seconds to look up at those signs, his family kept waving at him, and to, to just feel the grass and the, this blue sky and just to take it in. Just, he said, maybe literally two seconds. The problem was, Lou Brock was on first base. Everybody over 50 already knows how the story ends. Okay. Lou Brock, for those of you who are younger, uh, Brock was extremely fast. He was one of the best base stealers in the history of the game. And you don't lose your focus when Brock is on first base. He said he just caught the slightest glimpse of movement out of his left eye, and then all of a sudden, that little pop-up slide Brock had, remember that? All of a sudden, a man's back was right in front of his face, and he saw, it was very frightening, and he saw 20 there, and he thought, oh no, oh no. Because he had no idea Brock could have been uh, tagged out in the middle of the line for all he knew. He hadn't seen it at all. But he said, this is Lou Brock, and this is St. Louis, safe. <laughs> and so we're going off the field at the end of the inning. The third base umpire came over. He was a highly respected veteran. And he said, about that call on Brock. And the young guy said, <clears throat> yeah. And he said, that was one of the gutsiest calls I've ever seen a young umpire make because everybody on the field thought he was out. 35,000 people in the stands thought he was out, and millions and millions of people at home thought he was out. Even I, we were the only people with the angle to see he was really safe. And he clapped him on the shoulder, and gave him a little <laughs> wink, and walked off. And that guy said, to this day, I don't know if he was punking me. And he knew exactly what had happened. Well. We know that Christmas isn't about the wheel of the ump signs. We know it's not about the trappings. We know who's coming down that line, right? And Danny, I'm breaking new theological ground here. Don't think anybody's ever compared baby Jesus to Lubrock before. Uh, but it, you know, again, we've done this before. We know who's coming. We know it's the game that's central, not all of those trappings. And yet, so easy, so easy to forget about that. But sometimes Christmas isn't the trappings at all. Sometimes it's not the trimmings. Sometimes there's nothing there. When my grandpa was a very young man, he rode the mail. That was in southern Indiana, uh, where it's very hilly. There weren't roads every place yet. I'm not sure if there still are some places. Uh, the only way to get some people their mail was to shove it in the saddlebags and saddle up. Uh, and that's what grandpa did. And he would ride out and take folks their mail. One day he was riding, and it began to rain, and it was torrential, and he wanted a place to get out of that because the trees weren't enough cover. But he'd seen an old shack that clearly couldn't really be inhabited. It was a pretty run-down looking place. It never got any mail. Nobody could be living there way off, farther than he usually went. But he, he rode for that cabin to get out of the rain, and he had his right leg up over the horse's back and was balancing on his, the ball of his left foot on a slippery wet stirrup when the door cracked open and a rifle barrel snaked out. And somebody said, stop right there. And Grandpa did in that awkward position because of what one does with his right leg jacked up in the air waiting. And the voice said, what are you doing here? It was an old, old woman's voice. And Grandpa said, I'm delivering your mail. She said, I don't get no mail. He said, you do now. So she said, okay. And he let him come in. He got down and he, he searched through his saddlebags uh, and found, you know, he had to find something now, right? Uh, he found a couple old advertising flyers that had just been riding around in the bottom of those saddlebags. So he took those into her. 
and she made him a cup of tea. Now, my grandpa was not a quiet man. He was a silent man. There were entire days that went by where he probably didn't say a word, but there were many days that went by where he, you know, you could number him on your, your fingers. He, we got used to, uh, when you had dinner with them, you watched what he was looking at. If he was looking at the potatoes, you passed them because he wouldn't ask for them. Uh, he was that silent, and if he, he didn't notice, he just didn't get more potatoes. He was just a very silent man. So this was the, the young man this woman had now as a companion, but she was very quiet too. They just sat there and drank their tea and didn't talk together. And then he got up and nodded to her, and she nodded to him, and off he went. He began to deliver mail to her every time. You know, he, he rode the extra hills to get to her place, brought her some kind of little flyer or some random thing, and she'd nail them to her walls uh, for decoration. And a couple days before Christmas, it had snowed, and it was pretty deep, and it was harder to get out there. But he went anyway, and he took her another flyer, and they sat there drinking tea together, not talking just companionable silence. And as he got up to go, she spoke, and she said, it was good of you to leave your own family and come visit me on Christmas Day. And he looked around and realized she didn't have a calendar. She didn't go anyplace. Nobody came to her. She got gotten off by a couple of days someplace. It'd be easy to do. She, and later, you know, decades later, when he was a very old man and he was telling this story to us, he said, I guess she never knew it wasn't really Christmas. I guess he never knew it really was. I have a poem to read to you by Joseph Brodsky. I don't know if you're familiar with Brodsky. He was born in what was then the Soviet Union. He was Jewish, um, and he loved the Christmas story. And every Christmas Eve for decades, he wrote a new poem uh, about the coming of the, the Prince of Peace, the birth of Christ. Uh, the one I'm going to read you, he wrote uh, in 1971. At that point, he had been betrayed by a very close friend. He was not allowed to marry the woman he loved and with whom he had a tiny son. He would not be allowed to raise his own son um, or marry the woman he wanted to. He had been uh, incarcerated in a mental institution for a while um, for a trumped up, well, for being a poet, basically. Um, it was considered a middle defect. Um, he had been sent to um, the far north uh, in exile, internal exile, where his health had been broken. And he was on the verge and knew that he was on the verge of being exiled from his own country, where everybody he had ever known would be cut off to him. Every place he had ever been, he would never go back. And he would lose his native language as a poet. And at this precipice, this abyss, he wrote this poem. It's December 24th, 1971. And for those of you who are a couple years from your last uh, literature class, uh, in the last stanza, the, the wind that blows is the Holy Spirit, okay? When it's Christmas, we're all of us magi. At the grocers, all slipping and pushing, where a tin of halva coffee flavored is the cause of a human assault wave by a crowd heavy laden with parcels each one his own king, his own camel. Nylon bags, carrier bags, paper cones, caps and neckties all twisted up sideways, reek of vodka and resin and cod, orange mandarins, cinnamon, apples. Floods of faces, no sign of a pathway toward Bethlehem, shut off by blizzard. And the bearers of moderate gifts leap on buses and jam all the doorways, disappear into courtyards that gape, though they know that nothing's inside there, not a beast, not a crib, nor yet her, round whose head gleams a nimbus of gold. Emptiness. But the mere thought of that brings forth light as if out of nowhere. Herod reigns, but the stronger he is, the more sure, the more certain the wonder. In the constancy of this relation, is the basic mechanics of Christmas. That's what they celebrate everywhere, for it's coming push tables together. No demand for a star for a while, but a sort of goodwill touched with grace can be seen in all men from afar, and the shepherds have kindled their fires. Snow is falling, not smoking, but sounding chimney pots on the roof, every face like a stain. Herod drinks. Every wife hides her child. 
He who comes is a mystery. Features are not known beforehand. Men's hearts may not be quick to distinguish the stranger. But when drafts through the doorway disperse the thick mists of the hours of darkness, and a shape and a shawl stands revealed, both a newborn and spirit that's holy in yourself, you discover. You stare skyward and it's right there, a star. I hope that wherever you are in the Christmas story, whether you're the Grinch, or like me, you're one of the Herald Angels, if you've kind of lost track of what's coming down the line, or if you never had uh, anything there, any trappings at all, and you've lost track of what day Christmas even is, I hope you take a moment this Christmas season to stare skyward, because it's right there, a star. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. May this be a warning to you that if you tell really good stories anytime I'm with you, or if you're a teacher or an author or a librarian, you're going to be asked to preach once in a while. Uh, I know you already did show your appreciation, but if you would do so again, let's, let's let Katie know. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. This is a time in our service when we share the joys and the concerns, our prayers for peace, our prayers for hope, and there's several prayers listed in your bulletin. Hopefully you'll take those home and pray that and pray over them in your personal prayers this week. There are a few prayers I'd like to make mention of, and Janine's coming to get her microphone so that She'll come around, and if you have any prayers, just raise your hand. A few new prayers that are on our list. Prayers for Kathy and her family as Kathy's cousin Wendy entered hospice care recently. And so we continue to pray that Wendy remains without pain and surrounded by God's love in this time. Last week, I put a new prayer on there. Prayers for my cousin. Her name is Cookie, like the chocolate chip kind. And uh, she's in need of a double lung transplant. Cookie is 28 years old. She's a survivor of leukemia. And she was told this week by her doctor that she'll now be on oxygen uh, 24 hours and can no longer work as a nurse in the hospital. And so if you would join our family in praying for a miracle, we, we would be really appreciative. 
Other prayers, that ones that ones one that isn't listed is prayers for our friends Royal and Jan Y. Royal was hospitalized recently in Iowa City. He is starting to feel better, but please keep Royal and Jan in your prayers. And we continue to pray for Marilyn. She had hip replacement surgery a week ago, but she returned to Grandview this week. And, and so prayers for her as she's recovering from hip surgery. If you'd like her new phone number, if you've been trying to get a hold of her and haven't been able to, she has a new phone number. Please talk to Carol and she can get that to you. Other prayers you'd like to lift up. Janine will come around. Do you have track shoes on? Oh, I have Sandy's it. got it. Okay. <laughs> Um, I just, we are all aware of our pantry. Mm -hmm. um, we had a massive donation this week from a family. Uh, George and Richard and I put it together. I came this morning and there was more in the room. I really want to thank you. Mm -hmm. The community thanks you. Um, I have been involved in a, in a process meeting with other people in pantries. And um, the comment was, does anybody have... Um, ways in which we can collect cans. And I know right now Elam Church is building a Christmas tree with um, the canned goods that they're bringing. They thought our Super Bowl party and our Iowa State Iowa game party were wonderful ways of collecting extra food. But again, we thank you. Um, there are sacks out in the um, foyer for you guys to pick up and fill the pantry today for us. But again, as a church and as one of the people with Jan Keller who pushed this, um, we are very, very grateful for your generosity when it comes to um, filling our pantry. Thanks be to God and thanks be to you. I'm not sure whether you've heard it, but it's been announced. Christmas is canceled in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wally. We have a joy today, um, besides our preacher. Um, our friend Randy <laughs> has joined us here. He knew Katie was going to preach, so he came from Cedar Rapids. He's a friend of ours from University of Illinois days. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Welcome, Randy. Thank you. Uh, prayers for my friend Bill, who's um, dealing with some health issues right now. He really needs our prayers. Peggy, say say his name again. Bill. Bill, thank yeah. you. Prayers for Bill. Other concerns or joys you'd like to lift up? Oh, we have one here. I'm a new visitor, my name is Melanie. But I would like a prayer for, I'm getting a, a knee new two knee replacements coming up here short at the Iowa, v, Iowa City VA. So I'm kind of scared about that. And I'm kind of young to have to go through that, but it's a necessity and I have to get it done. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, for, t for two knee replacements. We will be praying. Thank you. Um, I went the other day to see uh, LaVon and uh, Marilyn and Joe and Mary, and some of you have asked particularly about Joe and Mary. Joe told me he hasn't been able to walk, but the physical therapist has been working with him, and he told me that he was able to walk 62 feet. <laughs> Wonderful. And, um, it was just great to visit with them, yes. all of them. Thank you, Lois. Yes, continued prayers for all of our friends at Grandview recovering and, and working on their health. And prayers for our friend Jenny, who is recovering from a stroke. She shared with me yesterday that she had a really good day with her vision, and she wanted me to, to let you know. So keep we keep her in our prayers as well. Thank you. Well, let us lift up all of these prayers now to God as we join one another in prayer. God of peace, 
We thank you for bringing us together today to prepare to expect your birth and your presence with us on earth. Today we remember again the peace you bring to us in the birth of a newborn baby. This is peace that we struggle to imagine. It is peace that dismantles and disarms. It's a peace we hope for, even though we may not be sure of its reality. It's the peace we pray for, the peace we sing about, the peace we imagine. This peace we believe in and pray for and work toward despite never-ending wars, despite Christmases being canceled, despite never-ending arguments, despite the grudges that hold us back and prevent us from loving more. And so our expectation of this peace isn't rooted in ignorance, Lord. May it be rooted in your love. May our expectation of this peace be rooted in your compassion, your never-ending forgiveness. We cannot attain this true almighty peace without you, so help us know and really live your peace, even when it seems foolish, Lord, even when it seems impossible. Because this time of year, we're reminded that nothing is impossible with you and your Son, our Savior, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You have probably heard about a project that a committee and I have been working on to update a a few things in the sanctuary. So Kathy's going to tell us about that now in our mission moment. <clears throat> well, as um, Danny uh, alluded to, over the past couple of years, concerns have been raised uh, by our church family about our audio and visual systems here at Hope. A group was formed and began meeting last April, um, and those on that committee include Mary and Dennis Borton, Jenny and Milt Van Gundy, Cole Weldon, Danny Musselman, and Eric Hall, and myself and Randy Baker. The intent was to evaluate our current audio and visual media arts equipment and to look at our needs moving forward. We made a dream list and then we invited three different companies to come and visit our church, hear about our needs and evaluate our space. At that point, we decided that improving our sound system was the priority and that improving the visual system would wait um, and become phase two of this project. The group felt that the main reasons for considering the changes to our current system was that our equipment was originally purchased um, to be used here, in in person, um, and for events that took place here at the church. It was not intended for the live streaming or the recorded broadcasts that we currently are doing. In addition, changes were needed because our current system was not reliable. And you've probably noticed that over the several (laughs) couple years, at least, that on and off our system works. So basically, our system is wearing out. Uh, The different pieces of equipment which were purchased at different times are not always compatible with each other anymore, and it needs to be updated. We received two different quotes and then made the decision to move forward with Vitham Technology Solutions, or VTS, They are a company out of Ankeny. The initial quote from VTS is for roughly $25,000. This quote includes the purchase of more speakers, more and better quality microphones, hanging microphones over the choir as well as the chimes, a new audio mixer, products for our hearing impaired worshipers, cables and cords, and the installation and labor costs. 
We currently have $8,000 from donations already made to the Sanctuary Media Fund and from memorials that have been des designated for sound system improvements. That leaves approximately $17,000 to raise in order to proceed with this project. The AV com Committee has decided to first approach our church family about consideration of donating to this project, and then after a time, we would like to go to the Endowment Committee um, for the remaining costs. We would appreciate your prayers as we move forward with this project, and feel free to talk to any of the members of the AV Committee if you have questions. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. This is a dream we have, and um, if you're looking for another place for a Christmas gift, there it is. <laughs> Friends, let's take some time to offer ourselves and our gifts back to God. Lord, we thank you that in the coming of Christ, we find your steadfast love and your true peace. May all the gifts we offer today lift up those in need and prepare the way of your salvation. In Christ's holy name, amen. Amen. Let, if you would please stay standing as you're able. Let's sing our closing hymn. This is, I want to walk as a child of the light. Let us praise God together.
Friends, as you go on your way, may you go with this blessing. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the light of the Holy Spirit, may it guide us. For it is God's light which will survive all of our circumstances, all of our shortcomings. And so let us peacefully prepare the way for the birth of the Christ child. Amen. May you go in peace, searching for the star.